While the kids are leaving also, um, some of you are surprised maybe that I'm standing up here expecting John to be here. Um, John will be here next week, God willing, and um, he's going to do the two chapters in 2 Samuel when he's here. And um, also, um, just to know, his dialysis is going great, his labs were good, he is having some chest congestion problems, and that's part of the reason why he's not here this morning. So, and I'm very happy for the opportunity to be able to share with you a few things. Am I getting some feedback, or is that just me? Oh, I am getting it? Okay. Should I talk lower or louder? <laughs> um, some of you were here last year when I started... Um, one started in May, and then the, um, the chapter four, I think, was in the end of July or even August. And um, I'm going to continue that when John begins uh, the transplant, which will be in about three weeks and that whole recovery time. Um, I'm going to be speaking through the rest of Daniel, chapter seven through 12. So that'll be about eight um, different sermons, and then also there'll be a missionary in there, so it'll be about nine weeks. Um, also, um, today, I thought what I would do is sort of give an overview of the first four chapters since it's been a year. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I want to run a particular theme through all four, the first four chapters of Daniel. And the theme really is, the title of it, as you see on your note sheet, it says, Where is God? And that's kind of a rhetorical question, but it is something that we're going to talk about today. And I, <clears throat> I want to start with... Um, Oh, I did want to make one mention before, in case I forget at the end. You'll see several people that have these um, uh, lanyards. And basically, you often hear John and Kevin and Eric and myself and others talk about that there's a prayer team here. And if you ever want any prayers, we're here or online. When you send prayers online, I, I send them to all of the prayer warriors and the prayer team. And also, as we finish worship service, sometimes they're standing around, but the problem is you didn't know who they were. <laughs> so now, if when you see that they want to pray with you, okay? And the card even says, it says pray very loud, and it says, how can I pray for you? So just know if somebody's wearing one of these, they are waiting for you to come if you wish to, to pray with you. All right, I want to start with a story. And um, this, uh, we're going to take a journey with me. We're going to start with a story and then the journey through the first four chapters, and it'll be more in a story format, reading some of the scriptures, because obviously I'm not going to cover all four. I did that last year in great detail. So it'll be this theme of where is God. But I'm going to start with a story. On June the 9th, 1972, um, there was a flood. And uh, believe it or not, it was the, uh, the flood lost more lives uh, in that flood. America lost more lives in that flood than any other in the history of the United States. And I'll bet 95% of you never even heard of it. It's not Katrina. It's the Rapid City Flood. June the 9th, 1972. I ended up counting over 400 bodies that were there, although the official count was 239, which was rather interesting. In fact, I'm writing about that. Eventually, I'll finish it. Um, but I was there that night when it happened. They had 10 inches of rain in just four hours. And it fell on the Black Hills. There's a river that was uh, running down from the Black Hills, and believe it or not, they built a, uh, they built a small lake that this river ran into with a dam at one end, and the dam led out to a small stream that went right through the middle of the city. Well, with uh, 10 inches of rain in just four hours, there were trees coming down, and that dam broke. I happened to have been working at Ellsworth Air Force Base at the time. I'd only been a Christian a little less than three months, and I was standing on a little bit of a hillside. We were going downtown to help, because there was flooding everywhere, but it wasn't serious. The dam hadn't broke yet. We started to go down, and the policemen stopped us, and they said, no, the water's already going over this small bridge. And so we got out of our car and just started walking a little bit of this hillside. And I saw something, you know, things occur in our lives that sometimes you never forget. I remember standing up on this hillside and I saw something that was like a giant, I couldn't tell what it was. It was like this giant sort of wall or surge. And it was about 10 feet high, maybe 20. And all of a sudden I realized that was water. And it wasn't like it was a wall. It was like it was this surge. And I remember it hitting a gas station and the gas pumps went choom, 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 and fire was everywhere. And then this, this, really, the water, which was, you know, where we were, it was kind of right there, but the whole city went down. It was not very good design of the city. And in the kind of the middle of this water, there was about 15, 20 feet of water rushing. Cars were coming down and being, you know, halfway wrapped around a tree. 
you know, parts of houses, roofs, and all that. And then after about 10 minutes of this, all of a sudden the screams, and the screams were everywhere. I'm not going to go into the whole details. But, um, I was involved all night with kind of helping people. About eight hours later, when the water was subsiding, I was taking, I was in a boat with this man that had been with me most of the night. And uh, we were looking for people that were stranded or hurt, and we found many. But in this one situation, I wanted to share this one part of the story. There was these two girls, teenage girls, probably 13, 14, and they were on top of a building, and the water was still pretty high, and we couldn't get the boat near there, so I had to swim to them. And it was about from here to that wall, when the boat was like here. So I swam to them, and I said, I can't take both of you. Let me take one, take them to the boat, and then I'll come back and get the other one. So I took the one. I said, you wait here. I'm coming right back. I turned and started swimming to the boat, around, and she was gone. In my mind, I think for years, I, th I thought I saw her jumping in the water, but the reality is, I realized later, and I'll talk about that, she was just gone. I thought she had died. For years and years, well, 1972 until about eight months ago, I lived with this just thinking that, why didn't I try to take two? The pain of that, when I would think about it, was it, it hurt. When I was in, uh, in Pioneer Bible Translators, we went through some training, and we called it... Um, healing prayer. And that is where not just one person prays, but where there's a group of two or three people that pray with someone. And we were talking about how to do, uh, go into prayer even in a deeper way. And as we were doing that, um, it was my turn to be prayed for, and I was asking, you know, whether there's anything in your past, you know, that still is, is a little bit of trauma, a little bit of struggle. And there were a couple events, one involved my mother, but this one was a big one also. And so I mentioned that. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, and just the fact that we went into deep prayer, and this one that was kind of leading it with the other two that were there, he said, explain to me exactly what was going on. So I told him what I just told you, and he said, you turned around and looked, and you didn't see the girl. Can you see Jesus anywhere around you at that time? I was like, what a weird thing to say. What do you mean? I, I don't see any. No, seriously, think about it. You've been a Christian only a couple of months. Can you feel that the presence of Jesus was there? And it's hard to explain, but when he said that, it was like, overwhelmingly, I felt the presence of Jesus. And um, I kind of turned in, as we're praying and talking about this, and then I realized it hit me like a ton of bricks. It, Jesus, I didn't hear any words, but Jesus very clearly said to me, she did not die. I cannot tell you what a relief that was. I mean, it's like this whole giant burden. I don't know where she went, went, but she did not die. As I was preparing for this, where is God? He is everywhere. We fail to recognize it. No matter where we are, no matter where we turn, no matter what we're involved with, whether it's good times or bad, he's there. God is here right now. Not only is he here, he's given us the Holy Spirit that is inside of us. So I want to talk about that theme, and I pray that I don't go too much over, in terms of the first four chapters of Daniel. Because whether it was with Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel himself, God was in the culture, in the environment. God is in our, our, our dreams. God is around us with various things, and he's in our troubles. God is in our faith. And God is in our sin. He's in the midst of everything that we do. So looking at Daniel, and some of you who were here last year will remember some of these things. I'm going to do it more as a storyline, but let's start with Joseph, believe it or not. If you remember, Joseph was um, obviously taken by his brothers and sold into slavery. And eventually he made his way, as you remember, to Egypt and earned um, a very strong through a whole lot of things, if you remember the story of Joseph, and he became a very um, strong leader in the whole country of Egypt to the point where he was in charge of all the grain. And if you remember then from the story of Joseph and his brothers, um, basically Joseph was able to feed them and all of Egypt basically then now was filled with the Israelis, the Jews. And after about um, 400 years of being in Egypt and eventually being slaves, um, the, uh, the Jewish nation was crying out to the Lord. And of course, as we know, the Lord sent Moses. 
And Moses led them um, out of Egypt and into the promised land. And then when uh, Moses led them into the promised land, and of course we know I'm really taking the 10,000 foot view right now, more than that, the 100,000. Um, there were eventually three kings that were chosen. It was Saul, David, and Solomon. And then um, after, at Solomon's time, really kind of a civil war broke out until now the, the Jews were divided into two kingdoms, the Israelis, into the northern and the southern kingdoms. And the southern kingdom was called Judah, and it consisted of the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. And during this time, um, there was one of the kings, um, Josiah, and he had a, he had a son, Jehoahaz, and Jehoahaz, um, and all of the Jews for a pretty long period of time were doing two things that were very bad. One of them was that they were adding gods to Jehovah. They didn't dismiss Jehovah, but they continued to add other foreign gods, and Jeremiah prophesied about this. They also were not following God's laws, specifically the Sabbath and other things. They were not following God's laws, and Jeremiah, as those who can remember his prophecy, said, if you don't change, you're, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years, if you remember the prophecy. All right, now we'll jump to Daniel, okay? In approximately 605 B.C., um, Nebuchadnezzar, because of some things that were going on at the time, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, ended up going to Jerusalem and basically besieging Jerusalem and took all the elite of Jerusalem, especially the young elite wise, and took them as captives into Babylon. And Daniel and his friends, which were eventually called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were part of that group. So the first thing that happened, if you can imagine, these three young sort of teenagers were taken into Babylon. And can you picture what they saw? You know, they, Jerusalem was not a, a big thriving city with tall buildings and all. But boy, they go into to Babylon. And the things that they saw, they realized they weren't in Kansas anymore. And they saw things like, um, you know, the streets paved with beautiful marble and gold was everywhere. They saw these gods with statues. They saw brothels and prostitution and they saw just all this. They saw a lot of beauty. They saw the, this city with giant walls, you know, towering high, very thick. And um, they were realizing that, wow, uh, this is not our home. Let me read a little bit from Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 21. Um, oh, before I read that, though, let me, let me mention something. Sorry, I'm trying to do the storyline. Daniel, um, as he was there, and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar knew that he had these young, wise people that he'd taken, and he was hoping to use them for their wisdom and for their counsel. And um, as he was there, he um, told his, uh, um, some of his eunuchs to go to these uh, four men and that he wanted to start feeding them very nice food, the king's food. And so the eunuch went to Daniel and his three friends and said, um, the king is going to be serving you the king's food. So, you know, honoring you. And Daniel realized very quickly that is not the food that we are supposed to eat. So in verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor. That's a key word and compassion in the sight of the chief and of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king, who assigned your food and drink, for why should he see that you were in the worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which was eventually Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Test your servants for 10 days, Daniel was saying. Let them be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let your appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them and in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter and whenever I see that, I think of in third world cultures, when you're fat, it means you're healthy and strong. I just can't help but think that. Of course, Mary Helen and I, we'd come back and, oh, you're so fat. And they were complimenting us. Anyway, <laughs> you're fatter in flesh than all the rest of the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and their wine and they were to drink and gave them vegetables. 
As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king uh, inquired of them, he found them ten times better in all, than all the magicians and chanters that were in the kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Point number one, and this is similar to the point I made actually a year ago in this particular chapter. We live in a world that is not our own, our home, not our own too. We basically live in Babylon right here. Last year I went through all the things that are happening in our culture and at this particular time, which have similar things that were going on in Babylon at the time. You know, in terms of what promiscuity, in terms of what they see, in terms of what they can worship and then can't worship, and uh, the laws that are in various schools right now about, you know, not able to pray, and all kinds of things going on are very similar to Babylon. So this world is not our own. But Daniel resolved in verse 8, which I think is so good, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. And because Daniel made that decision, realizing that God is there, and he said, I'm not going to eat that. God is there. He's, God is watching all of this. And so in verse 9, God gave him favor. So what's a key to that? God shows up in our culture of here in King George, and he showed up in Babylon, and De uh, Daniel never doubted his presence. And Daniel, he didn't try to fit in to the culture. This is really important. Daniel did not try to fit in. And we shouldn't try to do that either. We should not try to fit in to the culture of this world, understanding that our citizenship is in. You know the answer. Where's our citizenship? It's in heaven. Point number two. Where is God and what does he want us to do? In our culture, here in King George, here in Virginia, here in the United States of America, where is God? And if we recognize that he's here and he's with us and he's in the midst of us, he's in the midst of our culture, then what do we, what is, not what do I want God to do, but the key to that, and Daniel said that, what does God want me to do? How can I serve him? Living in King George, Virginia is like living in Babylon. Make your life here in King George about God and seek him out in King George and in your home, at your work, at church. He is here. Know it and believe it. Daniel did. Point number three. When we decide for God, really related to point number two, he will decide for us. When we decide for God, he will decide for us. That doesn't mean he's going to answer all of our prayers exactly the way we want it to happen. But it does mean that in deciding for us, he will be with us no matter what's going on, no matter how serious it is. We may end up in, in jail because we're defying something in our culture. But God will be with us, and he has a purpose. And you've heard this kind of story before, and maybe it's to, for you to share the gospel with people in jail. We have somebody even in this church right here that actually that happened. And you can actually serve God no matter where you are, realizing that he's present in everything that we do. Point number four. Make your culture, your home, your church, your work, and everything you do about God, not about you. Listen to that again. Make your home or your culture, and I always would rather substitute culture, make your culture about God, not about you. He's sovereign. Make it about him. Not the kind of, so often, Yes, we, most of us would say, yeah, we believe God is all around us and he's with us. But a lot of times we want, we have expectations of what that means. We want God to, to be a certain way or to act in a certain way. That's very dangerous. Let it be about God because that then is about you. It's about you wanting control. And if God doesn't answer your expectation the way he should, then you think, what? He's not there. But he is. Who is that hero in chapter 1? Think about that for a minute. Who's the hero of chapter 1? Yeah, somebody said it. Say it nice and loud. God, God is the hero of chapter 1. Not Daniel. Not Nebuchadnezzar when he finally realized the power of this almighty God, Jehovah. God is the hero of chapter 1. See how 
all throughout this entire chapter, yes, this is about Daniel's uncompromising faith. We don't deny that. There's a lot of lessons there about Daniel's faith. But that faith is based solely on depending on God for his providence, not just Daniel's faith. God's control, sovereignty, and love cultivated Daniel's faith. So it was about God, and that is what cultivated Daniel's faith. As Daniel and his friends were considered now as wise, the wise men of Babylon, and uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar really kind of recognized them as something special. And then at the end of the time when the king had commanded uh, that they should be brought into the chief eunuchs and brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So he really honored them. Then about three years after, and it's interesting, this is something I don't think I shared with last year, that when uh, the culture of Babylon at the time, when they would go and conquer these various areas of the world and they would take in some of the sharpest and smartest to join in with the Babylonian culture to help them advise and, and interpret things and so on, they usually went through three years of training. So Daniel, Shadrach, and Amisha, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were all in the middle of this three years of training um, to become, which is required for astrologers and enchanters and so on. And then in the midst of this training, or towards the end of it probably, Daniel received a message from Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, and he and his friends were to be put to death. And Daniel's like, oh, what's going on? What do you mean? I'm in the middle, we're at the end of our training, we're, we're here, we're ready to serve, and now you're coming saying we're going to be put to death? So Daniel asked why. And Arioch explained that the king had a dream. You might remember this, the king had a dream. So he asked the enchanters, but for some reason, these three youths that were still kind of at the end of their training, they weren't part of it, okay? But he asked all of the wise men and astrologers and enchanters, you know, I had a dream and I want you to interpret it. And they said, go tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. And he said, no. If you are truly wise men and chanters and astrologers, you can tell me what I dreamed. Then you can interpret it. And of course the response was, no one can do that. But then Nebuchadnezzar said, if you can't, then all of you in the whole, all of Babylon, all the wise men, the enchanters, the astrologers will all be put to death. So now he sent out his emissary to begin that process and he came to Daniel. And then when he came to Daniel, um, Daniel was obviously surprised, beginning in verse 16. Daniel went into the king and he, when he heard this and he asked for more time so that he might interpret the dream for him. It's kind of pretty confident of Daniel. And I imagine, I imagine Nebuchadnezzar thought, wow, that's pretty confident of a 17 or 20 year old young man. He thinks he can interpret it if I'll give him just a little more time. All right. Nebuchadnezzar said, we're going to see if you can truly say what my dream was. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might be not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised God in heaven. Point number five. God is in the midst of our problems no matter how great or how small. He is there. So turn to him for strength, not your strength, not how you are going to solve the problem. Turn to God. And Daniel's confidence in just praying to God, realizing and understanding that Daniel, just like we're going to see you in the next chapter, Daniel, like his three friends, even if God did not answer it like Daniel was hoping he would, Daniel would not, I don't believe, have lost his faith. But look, look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God has a purpose for everything, even if he doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we would like him to answer. And in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him. And that's what Daniel did. He did not lean on his own understanding. The first thing he did was he went to his friends and to God. So I want to offer you, and I did this kind of last year a little bit, that there are, um, point number six, there are steps to solving a problem. Specific, specifically, what steps did Daniel use? The first step that he used is first he wanted to know what is the problem. He recognized and defined the problem, and he realized that if we don't solve this problem, it's going to lead to death. All right, it's all there. Then number two, 
Daniel didn't panic. This is a big thing. You know, my goodness, if someone would come to you and says, you know what, I want you to help me solve this problem, and if you can't solve it, you're going to be killed. <laughs> It'd be like, uh, 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 hold on, let me run away. You know, and I would imagine, uh, you know, but Daniel, you don't have to see anything about that. Daniel didn't think about, you know, the fight or flight kind of reaction. You know, how would have you felt? If you can't solve this problem, you're going to die. You just want to get out of there. Would you have turned to God? I don't care what the problem is. Would you have turned to God? Or would your panic been so high that you wouldn't have even hardly been able to think? Daniel did not panic. He had confidence that God was there in the middle of that problem in that situation. He accepted that God was there over and over. That's the lesson that we hear in these first four chapters. Recognizing God's presence is only the first step. Then the next step is you go to God. You go to God. And more than just um, simply, okay, and this going to God, this is important. All, many of us go through the, kind of those first couple of steps. It may not be a problem unto death, but we'll go through those things and we will go to God and we'll pray. And then we say, you know, after we do a lot of prayer, we say, oh, I heard God tell me. Have you ever heard that? I heard God tell me. I'm not saying that that's wrong. Part of it is very, very good. But I think this next step is kind of crucial with that. If you go to God in prayer because of a specific problem and you believe that God is giving you an answer, I would suggest to do what Daniel did. And that is this in this next step. Daniel sought his friends to pray with him. This is important. If you believe that God is telling you to do something, have that um, enforced, reinforced by people that you trust that are prayerful people, strong Christians, and seek them to pray with you and see if they're seeing the same thing. And it's interesting because then after he did that, God's presence does not mean that he will do what we think he should do. He wants us to seek him. And notice how Daniel did that. He said, plead for mercy from God. They were seeking what God wanted to do in his mercy. Daniel did not necessarily think he deserved mercy or that he deserved for this to be taken care of by God. So he prayed to God for mercy, not expecting it. That's a big point too. Daniel did not think it was necessarily um, deserve mercy. He knew it was totally in God's hand, so don't hey, God's hand, so don't assume. After praying into the night, Daniel heard from God. Obviously, his friends were praying with him. And then I wanted to read some of um, some of those passages in Daniel. Um, I don't know if this is all up there because I decided to go ahead and read this, beginning with um, verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and season. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you, praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what is asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Compare that to Job for a minute. Job chapter 38. I'm sorry, that's not up there. I woke up this morning. It just hit me. You know, what Daniel's words of what he did in his prayer, he talked about how God is everywhere. He's involved with everything. And that was part of his prayer. He acknowledged all that. And Job, if you remember all through, if, 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 if I've done something wrong, God, okay. If I've done this, God, okay. If I've done, not understand, kept inquiring. And finally, in chapter 38, I love it. As God answered Job after all this time and all the questions he kept asking all the time of God and assuming that he understood some things about God, although he didn't necessarily waver in his faith, but boy, he sure is questioning God. And what did God say in Job 38? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Oh, can you imagine that? Tell me if you understand who marked off the dimension. Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? Where the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth with the womb? When I made the clouds in its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When, it, when I fixed limits to it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and you can go no further? Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn in its place? 
that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their unpra unpraised arm is broken. Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? On and on and on. My goodness. You see the difference between Job and Daniel? I mean, Job still kept his faith, but, but Daniel acknowledged God as having all that power. And no matter how God was going to answer Daniel, he was willing to accept it. And so he began his prayer acknowledging that. So often when we pray about a problem, be sure to acknowledge God and what he's done. Honor him first. Don't simply say, Lord, I got this big problem. I need your help. I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong. But boy, the Lord, I think, likes to be worshipped and honored. So honor him in your prayer. Start with that like Daniel did. All right, I am going to have to hurry. <laughs> All right. So, before Daniel interpreted the dream, he made it clear that it was not him, Daniel, who did this. Again, acknowledging God and God's sovereignty, and God is the one who solves the mysteries, not Daniel. It was God and only God who could do such a thing. In verses 27 to 28, Dan Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, or magicians, or astrologers can show you the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made it known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You notice he didn't say, he's made it known to me, so then I can tell you. He, God, has made it known. Daniel's just the voice. This is not Daniel's power. Daniel's just the voice. And then Daniel began to interpret um, the dream. And I do have this picture. I think it's still there. There you go. I'm not going to read everything again. We're just going to very briefly go through in Daniel's interpretation of the dream. He said that the King Nebuchadnezzar was seeing a, a giant, I think it was 60 um, cubits tall, and the head was of gold, and he eventually interpreted that. He told Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. And then um, on his chest were, and arms were silver, and it made it clear that that's the next kingdom that's going to replace Babylon, which ended up being Persia, as we know from history. Then the one after that in the middle was bronze, was the next kingdom that's going to replace Persia, and we know from history that was Greece. And then after that was um, the legs and thighs, and that was of iron, and that was primarily Rome that's replaced Greece and the, during the time of Jesus. And then you have the feet were a mix of iron and clay, and it even talks about they were mixtures, so it was a little bit of strength and a lot of weakness. And then Daniel went on to explain, and then there's a large rock hewn, not necessarily with human hands, that came and it ended up crushing the entire statue. And as we talked about a year ago, there's all indications that that rock was Jesus at the end, during the end times, which we're going to refer a lot back to this when I get to Daniel chapter 7 through 12, because that's primarily prophecy, and we're going to refer back to this. So, in the days, uh, in verses 2, 44 to 45, and in the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering of incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods. Boy, we see this with Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to see this all the way through these first four chapters. Truly your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king that he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel still remained in the king's court. Point number seven. Acknowledging God's presence should result in honoring and worshiping him. And that's what Daniel did at the end of this. I didn't read all those verses, but basically after this was answered and all the way through it, 
Daniel, the result of acknowledging God in the midst of these, acknowledging God's presence, should result in our honoring and worshiping him as we see God act in our lives. Notice the other benefit of recognizing God's presence in our lives, the ability to reveal mysteries. This is especially true when we consider the presence of the Holy Spirit. Think about New Testament passages. The Holy Spirit is within us. And we have the Holy Spirit to help us understand God's word and interpret a lot of things from God's word. Your time, your talents, your gifts, your body, your finances, heart, obedience, singing, work, everything you do should be about God and not about you. Now as the story continues, Nebuchadnezzar interprets the dream in his own way. We're in chapter 3 now. <laughs> I almost have to laugh at this. Because after he hears all this and he acknowledges God, and then all of a sudden <laughs> he decides, whoa, man, that's pretty there's a whole statue, and I'm the gold head. So what does he do? He builds a statue. And he builds a statue, and he probably pretty similar to what his dream said. He's got right at the top a gold head. And boy, he's proud of that one. So he builds this beautiful statue, and then what's the next thing he does? He said, man, okay, I'm at the head of all this. I even had it revealed to me by, by this God of Daniel. And so I want everyone now to worship me. And so let's read some of this. Um... Well, before that, obviously he, made, he gave a decree, a decree. He said, when you hear the sound of the music and various things, everyone in all of Babylon, they're going to play it loud enough. I don't know how they did that, but they were able to do that probably because of the way the city was shaped and played all over the city. When you hear the sounds of this music, everyone is to stop what they're doing and worship the statue that could be seen all throughout Babylon. It was so high. And then some of the people that were probably jealous of uh, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego's position they basically said, um, they told the king that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not worshiping the king's statue as decreed. And the king was furious and called them into his presence. Now, Daniel was not part of chapter 3 here. Not sure where he was, but these three were definitely part of it. And so he called them in and he said to them in, uh, beginning in verse 14 in chapter 3, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I set up? Is that true? Now, if you are ready, when you hear, it's kind of, he's giving them the second chance, okay? Okay, now, all right, I understand that. But did you understand now? So when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fire, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? What's interesting is their response. Uh, King, we don't have to wait for you to play the music. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But, but, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow. There's that sovereignty of God. There's that, it is not what those three are determining God hopefully will save them. It is whether he saves them or not, I will and we will still not serve you. We will not serve other gods. We will not serve the culture. We will not be part of this. We will serve God even if we die. Point number eight, God is in the midst of your faith and he will always be with you even in the fire. He won't abandon you. And you might be burned. You might die. But he'll be with you. Just like the stoning of Stephen. You remember that? Stephen preached that sermon in the New Testament. And as he was being killed by the Jewish leaders, he still died and was probably suffering a lot. But then he opened his eyes and he saw Jesus. Even in the fire. But even if he's not, your faith will help. And the Holy Spirit will be there even if you end up dying. This is part of what the whole function of the Holy Spirit, what he does, is, is, you know, this presence of God is now manifested in him living in us. I want to say something about this. Um, as my son, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> as my son was dying uh, last year, several months ago, there was someone that sent Mary Helen something. And I first, when I read this, I was like, uh, I don't like that. But I need to read it to you because now I have come to a whole new understanding. Listen to this. And I didn't have it up here, but I want you to write this down. 
This was a friend, well, it was a friend quoting someone, but the saying was so powerful. This is God responding to you, or like he responded to those three. Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? Our son was dying at the time, and I got that. And it says, can you thank me for trusting you with this experience? It's like, what do you mean? You're trusting Mary Helen and me and our family with the experience of watching our son die? And then, even if I never tell you why. In other words, can we trust God even in that suffering? Can you trust me, God is saying? Even if I never tell you why? Even right now, Mary Helen and I look at this and we're saying, okay, this is faith. Can we trust that Joshua, my son's death, was an experience that God wanted us to go through? It says even thank him. That's a hard one, guys. Thank almighty God that our son is dying of cancer. Man, that cuts hard. But do I trust God enough? I don't know why. Maybe there's some reason I'll find out. I do know that some of you were at his, uh, his funeral. He had a 21,000 people almost on a daily basis. And he never once asked for his own healing. I suppose we can see some things now. But even if he never totally tells us why. When we get to heaven, we're going to ask. All right. I got through that. My mother said something to similar, and I think I might have mentioned this in another sermon. This was about 20, 25 years ago. She was on the mission field was in Africa, and I was being cursed and cursed to die by witch doctors, and, um, you know, it was a little concerning, not much. You know, did I have enough faith to not worry about that kind of thing? And my mother, in the midst of all this, and we were going through a lot right then. We were being attacked. I mean, left and right, this spiritual attack was huge, and even physical attack. I was getting every disease in the world. You know, my mother said to me, she said, boy, God must really love you. What? <laughs> Mom, you know, I've gotten five diseases. I've had malaria 12 times, typhoid three times, cholera twice, two amoebic liver cysts, bell heart, see ya, shit, some, and on and on and on, and now I'm to die, and I'm going out, we got our cars breaking down, it's been stolen six times, and my mother says, wow, well, you. <laughs> I think I, we learn through our suffering. God is there. He's with us. And no matter what it is he's trying to teach you, listen. Listen. As the story progresses to Daniel chapter 4, <clears throat> we see Nebuchadnezzar actually honoring God. This is very interesting, this chapter. Because it begins with Nebuchadnezzar honoring God. He, he honors God and says how wonderful God is and all these kinds of things. And, you know, he's, uh, he's learned, it looks like, you know. And then all of a sudden... <clears throat> He has a dream. And it's a very disturbing dream. It's about a big tree. And so um, he doesn't know how to really interpret the dream. So he eventually calls Daniel. And in beginning in verse 20 in chapter 4, let's read this. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Those leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant. And in which the food was for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you. He's probably thinking, oh, that's a good part of the dream. You, O king, who have grown and become strong, your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field and let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord, the king, that you shall be driven out from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. This has nothing to do with you, O king. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the root of the tree, your kingdom, 
shall be confirmed for you from a time, the time you have know, that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So that's going to happen to him until he recognizes that God is God. Twelve months passed. Twelve months. And he really did become like an animal, if you remember that. Eating grass, fingernails growing long, hair, I'm sure, all scraggly, crawling on the ground. His mind was gone. Is it not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? While the words are still in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has left you and departed from you. Just as Daniel prophesied, the king became like an animal, beginning with verse 34. At the end of the days, finally, after seven years, that was the seven periods of time, at the end of the days, Nebuchadnezzar finally realized, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. He finally was beginning to recognize this has never been about me. It's been about God. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his kingdom is the everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Whether it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or even Nebuchadnezzar, when you realize that God has answered your prayers, it should reflect worship, honoring him. Don't forget that. When God has taken you through the fire and maybe you didn't die, at the end of that, honor him, worship him, thank him. Even Nebuchadnezzar did that. The host of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. Point number nine, God sees our sins and is always ready to forgive us. Even what Nebuchadnezzar did, he can forgive us if we turn to him. Philippians 1, 18 to 24. Paul understood and accepted God's presence in his life to the point where he, Paul, longed to die and be with God. That does not come immediately, but only after he suffered so much. Can you imagine Paul in Philippians when he talks about, it would be better for me if I died than to continue living. I can die and be with the Lord. But if it's the Lord's will, then I'll stay here. Paul also recognized God's presence everywhere and everything and every problem. I want to read a couple things at the end. Yeah, the worship team can come up. I want to read a couple things and then I want to pray. Psalm 56, 4. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May, he shout, may we shout for joy over your victory and lift up your banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to the anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary and the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give us victory. Answer us when we call. I pray that at the end, that as when I get older and older, that as people see me, that they don't see me, that they see God. And it's not really being arrogant, it's really being because I, I am so sinful in so many ways. Yesterday we had a prayer warrior summit and I 
we were to all go for 15 or 20 minutes listening to the Holy Spirit in silence, but listening. And as we came back, we all shared some things, and almost every one of us said, I couldn't start listening until I confessed. I had to confess before I could hear. I had to acknowledge who I am. I am not worthy of salvation. I am not worthy of God's mercy. He gives it. And sometimes um, before we can hear him, we need to realize who we are. Would you pray with me, please? Our gracious, almighty God, Jehovah, I do want to begin even this prayer with confession, Lord. I confess that um, I pray that, that some of what I said was you, Lord, and not me, not me, Lord, it was you. Forgive me of my sins, Lord, for they are many. I want to acknowledge you in everything, Lord. You've created everything. You've created the, the mountains, the seas, the birds, the flowers, the beauty of springtime. We could go on and on, Lord. You are sovereign. You are the one who is everything. Lord, let us continually acknowledge your presence in our lives and so that more and more we realize every time we wake up, our thoughts are of you because we know you're there. And Lord, help us, help me, as we continue to mourn for the loss of our son, even though it's been five months now, Lord, help us to continually realize that to thank you for that experience, Lord, those are hard words to say, Lord, but I believe that that is what you want me to say because it's about you. I don't understand, but it's about you. So I accept that, Lord, as hard as it is to say that. And I know that I'll never hear why until we're with you. Lord, you are our God. You're our creator, and we love you. Be with us, Lord, in all that we do. Let us remember you in everything, because your presence is everywhere. And it's through your Son and our Savior that we pray. Amen.